This free presentation is brought to you by Quantum University. How would you like to know the molecular secrets of how to stay healthy? This is Dr. Mercola, and I've been a family physician for over three decades. And 20 years ago, I established Mercola.com, which is the most visited health site in the world. And in that journey, this process of acquiring knowledge to help treat my patients and understand health at a deeper level, I've compiled lots of information. And to share the bulk of it with you, I would need eight hours, but I'm going to seek to compress that into this one hour presentation, essentially give you the highlights, not all the details, but the highlights of what you need to know to help optimize your health and prevent the degenerative disease cascade that is and the implosion that is incumbent upon our society where we have 1,600 people dying every single day from cancer in the United States alone. So I bet you'd be interested in finding out how to make sure that doesn't happen to you or someone you love. So it all boils down to understanding how your body creates energy. And it does that through little structures within your cell called mitochondria. And you know, we've got lots of cells and we have perhaps 10 times as many uh, bacteria, but we have a hundred times as many mitochondria and maybe even up to a thousand. We have over a quadrillion and these structures within our cells are evolved from bacteria that migrated into our cells many years ago and they produce the energy currency of our body, which is called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So when these mitochondria become damaged with time and over time as you age and expose yourself to toxic influences that is what contributes to most of the diseases like cancer heart disease diabetes and obesity so to understand how this damage occurs it's really an artifact of the way energy is produced you see where well, your food is fuel it basically breaks down into two components, fat and carbohydrates. And both of them are broken down into substrates which are transferred into your cell and essentially used in your mitochondria to create these ATP. But the artifact of that energy production process is that it creates something called a reactive oxygen species or ROS for short. And when you have, and those are good, they're not necessarily pernicious molecules or dangerous. I mean, many of you have heard of those and maybe that's perhaps why you're taking antioxidants, but it's my contention and many experts that excessive antioxidants can indiscriminately suppress beneficial reactive oxygen species. So the key is to make sure that you don't have excessive reactive oxygen species because they are powerful signaling molecules that your body needs to stay healthy. And in fact, they can form hormetic stressors that actually cause your body to make its own antioxidants rather than swallowing them externally. So when your body has excessive free radicals and it causes damage to the cell membranes, the proteins and the DNA within the mitochondria and in the cellular nucleus that can lead to all these diseases like cancer, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and seizures. This is the consequence of damaging your mitochondria. And the, the key is to keep them as healthy as you can for as long as you can. And one of the challenges that we have in our modern culture is that we've adopted a, a relatively high carbohydrate diet. And it's not necessarily intrinsically wrong with that, but if you do it continuously for long periods of time, you are clearly going to have challenges. And the primary challenge is that your body stops burning fat as its primary fuel. The danger of the damage that occurs when you do that is that when you burn fat for fuel, you're creating something called ketones, which is essentially a very small fat. It's a short chain fatty acid and it burns very clean. It has very little pollution in your cells. So as a result of that, you create less reactive oxygen species and you burn cleaner fuel. When you're burning glucose or carbohydrates as your primary fuel, you create far more excessive radicals. And the answer is not to swallow antioxidants. The answer is to have your body biologically produce the optimum amount of reactive oxygen species. And that's what you do when you burn fat for fuel. So I'll bet you'd be interested in, in knowing how to do that. 
Well, it's, it's a process and some, some of you, it may take uh, a few days. Some who are metabolically da damaged and heavy and overweight and have a variety of other conditions, it may take a few months or even longer to make this transition. But the first step, and this is the first step, is just to slower your carbohydrate content to, to what we, uh, about 40 grams of net carb. And a net carb is a carbohydrate when you subtract the fiber. So and you don't do this forever, you just do this into the transition period until your body's able to start making ketones and burning fat for fuel. And then you can have more carbohydrates and pulse them back in, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. But this, so essentially you keep your net carbohydrates, your net grams of carbohydrates to under 40 grams. And that means no grains, no starchy vegetables, no fruit, and, and you can have unlimited uh, green vegetables for your carbohydrates. Um, the other component that we want to be aware of is your protein. And, you know, this may sound a bit like paleo in that we're having a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, but it's, it's significantly different. I'm going to explain to you in, in a number of important ways. One is the protein content. This is not unlimited protein because protein can be even more damaging to your health than carbohydrates. And by that, I mean excessive protein. And most of us eat excessive protein. Your body only needs so much. And if obviously you don't get it, you're going to have serious consequences. But when you eat too much, it has a problem too. And when I went to medical school, this was not known. In fact, this pathway was just discovered within the last 10, 15 years. And to, to this very day, most medical students are taught it when they go to medical school. But the pathway is called M. TOR, which is short, short for mechanistic target of rapamycin. And this is one of the most important metabolic signaling pathways in your body. And what happens when you activate or stimulate, it causes muscle growth, and, but it all, which is good if you're trying to build muscles, but it also has the downside, which is that it can uh, impair your body's ability to remove damaged and senescent cells a process that we call autophagy, or if it's directed towards my, mitochondria, it's called mitophagy. So you don't want to suppress that, and you do suppress it when you eat larger amounts of protein on a regular basis. And in fact, one of the most important strategies that you could implement is to make sure that you're having the right amounts of protein long-term if you want to extend your lifespan, because one of the uh, diseases I didn't mention, I do consider a disease, is aging. Uh, and these diseases are a consequence, but aging is, the, the, of course, the metabolic uh, pathway that most of us follow is that many of us are following at an accelerated rate. If you want to slow that rate down, cut your protein down to the appropriate level. So what are the appropriate levels? Um, appropriate levels would be about a gram per kilogram of lean body mass. And if you want to convert that to the imperial system, that's uh, about... A, one gram, half a gram of protein for every pound of lean body mass. Uh, so for most people, that's gonna be between 40, even as low as 30 to 60 or 70 grams of protein. So the key here though, is that's not the amount of meat that you would be eating necessarily. This doesn't mean a 70 gram piece of, of beef or, or fish. It would mean that you'd have to look up that uh, product or that, that food source in a, in a nutritional database and, and calculate how many grams of protein were there and just add it up for the day and that's what you want in the transition phase where you're teaching your body to burn fat for fuel. So another important part of this strategy is that we want to eliminate toxic oils and that's almost that's the largest percentage of food that people are eating in this country these processed toxic oils and they're largely responsible for much of the damage and degeneration that occurs. So when uh, people go on plant-based diets, uh, frequently they'll improve, and a large part of that is because they're removing these toxic oils. Even though they're based on plants, when you, re when you industrially refine them and process them uh, and, and, and uh, have them in high concentrations that you would never be able to get in nature, then that causes uh, loads of metabolic complications. But there's a oil I'd like to mention that many of you may have in your cupboards right now, and I'll bet if you're watching, you might have flaxseed oil. And many people I've lectured to do, and I tell them that if you have it in your cupboard, please think of someone you uh, know of that 
is uh, either a neighbor or a relative that you don't like and give them that flaxseed oil. Because you, you don't, you shouldn't be eating it. It's not vet, met for humans. Does that mean you shouldn't have flax seeds? No, I have flax seeds every day. I don't have a lot of them. I have about a tablespoon. And they're organic, raw flax seeds that I soak overnight and to help break them, them down and some of the, the, uh, uh, the anti-nutrients in there. And uh, then I'll have that in my smoothie in the morning. So flax seeds are great. There's nothing wrong with them. You just don't want to have it an ex as extracted oil. And that pretty much holds true for most all oils. The, the few exceptions would be something like olive oil or coconut oil, but, but anything else like sesame or sunflower, you, you really, your, your goal is to get it from the actual seed, not from the extracted oil. Or avocado oil is another one there's confusion. Um, so nothing wrong with avocados. I think it's probably one of the best, healthiest foods out there, but I wouldn't have avocado oil. I would have avocados. You know, that's one of the key principles in this whole strategy is to eat real food, stay away from processed food. And uh, many times when you do that, it's not so much the real food that's helping you help nourish you back to health, it's eliminating that processed food, the dangerous food, which is probably more damaging to you than the health providing benefits of, of the real food. So let's focus on some of the, one of the healthiest fats you can possibly get, and that's an omega-3 fat. I'm sure you've heard of omega-3s. But this is a special one. It's the longest chained omega-3 that we use nutritionally, and it's called DHA. It has 22 carbons in it. It's two carbons longer than EPA and two carbons longer yet still from ALA, which is the omega-3 fat that most people consume when they have plant-based sources. And your body has the ability to convert that 18 carbon fat, ALA, to all the way up to DHA, but it doesn't do that very well, does it? relatively inefficiently so that you're not going to create enough of this beneficial fat if you're only relying on plant-based sources. So uh, you don't have to guess on this. Fortunately, this is the 21st century and there are tests that are available. There's a test called the Omega-3 Index and you can get it anywhere we have on our site too, but it will actually measure the amount of omega-3 fats in your tissues and the omega-6 and tell you if you're in a healthy ratio. And, and the, the implications of that. So what's the best way to get this DHA? Well, many people swallow supplements and that's one way uh, and certainly, I, but I don't think it's the best way. When if you're, but sticking on supplements for a bit, fish oil of course is the most popular. Uh, I'm not a big fan of fish oil for a variety of reasons. If you're going to use supplements, I think krill is far superior because of the phospholipids and the astaxanthin. It's just a better supplement overall, but I don't think you should get your DHA from supplements, I think you should get it from, here's a surprise, real food. So what's the best real food? Well, it would be seafood. Now we have problems with seafood, of course, because we've burned coal, which is loaded with mercury, it's vaporized and fallen down to the waterways and essentially accumulated in the oceans and the riverways and the waterways of the world. And it bioaccumulates in larger fish. So most large fish are contaminated with not only mercury, but dioxins and PCBs and PBDEs, so, and all the other industrial toxins that tend to get accumulated. And if you're not too far from any water supply, it's gonna be drugs. The drugs that, the pharmaceutical drugs that we all take that are urinated out uh, and, and are excreted into the waterway. So you don't want that. So the best type would be very small fish or fish from pristine areas like Alaskan, wild Alaskan salmon or sardines, anchovies, fish roe, fish eggs would be really good. So, and I have some of those every day. So um, this is a high fat diet because if you're going to reduce your protein to the 40 or 70 grams per day that I mentioned earlier and your carbohydrates to 40 net grams, that means 80, 85% of your calories will be coming from fat. And here's the key, if you don't pay attention to the quality of the fat, you will become sick very quickly because you have to have the highest quality, healthy fat. And, it, and you could do this as a vegetarian. I mean, it doesn't have to be animal fat, it can be, but there's plenty of great healthy uh, vegetable fats out there. And I said, my, one of my favorites, and I think one of the best is avocados. You could have two, three of those a day. And not only is our avocados healthy for you, but they're loaded in potassium. And most of us have that distorted sodium to potassium ratio. And, and avocados is one of the highest densities of potassium of any foods you can eat. Uh, and they are a little pricey. Uh, so one of the, the best tip is to grow them yourself. Uh, I've lived in Florida and I'm able to do that. And, 
in the process of starting to harvest a significant number of my avocados now. But many of you are not going to have access to that. So the trick that I uh, teach people is that wait until they go on sale at your favorite grocery store and know you don't have to buy these organically. We've done the testing in our, we've hired uh, independent objective labs and we've, we've shown that there's really no difference in the, any pesticide levels or contaminants within the avocado organic versus not organic. Is organic better? Probably, maybe a little more nutrient dense, but not significant enough to justify the very significant price increase. So get regular avocados, wait until they go on sale. And when they go on sale, buy. 30, 40, 50, 70 of them, depending on how many people you're buying them for, but buy, here's the key, is you buy them rock hard green, and they will stay in your refrigerator for three to four weeks, and the key, here's the other part of the equation, is you have to take them out about two or three days before you plan on consuming them, because you're not gonna be able to eat them green. So that's a key to lower your cost, because I realize that's important for most of us. So coconut oil is another healthy fat. MCT oil, which is a derivative typically of coconut oil, is, has shorter carbons in it, uh, shorter fats, shorter chain fat, carbon fats. So typically eight or 10 uh, with MCT oil. Um, there's a few cautions here. You can get the inexpensive one that has the eight, C8 and C10, and that will work. The one that works better for creating these ketones, these, these lean, be, lean body burning fat machines, molecules that will have very few reactive oxygen species is to get the C8 or the caprylic acid. So problem with MCT oil is that you can't use a lot of it initially. You have to start small, maybe with a teaspoon a day, otherwise you'll have very loose stools and you'll regret taking it. So, but you can work up to a few tablespoons a day. Other good sources would be nuts. And the, the key here would be something like macadamia nuts or pecans. Why? Because they are relatively low in protein, low in carbs and very high in fat. In macadamia, it's really high in oleic acid, which is the same type of fatty acid we find in olive oil. And it's been associated with a number of health benefits. Uh, you could also get it from seeds. Speaking of olive oil, though, you have to be careful because about 80% of the olive oil that's sold in the United States is adulterated and damaged and really not fit for human consumption. So that's why when you buy your sardines, they should be in water, not in olive oil. That's not human grade. So uh, there are some um, good quality brands of olive oil out there, many produced in the United States. You just have to be careful and, and search diligently for them and confirm that because part of the reason is these olives are uh, good olive oil. So pricey is that you have to pick the olives when they're ripe within a day or so or two of them being ripe. And then after they're harvested, you have to press them ideally within an hour or two. So it's a very time intensive and carefully orchestrated process. And obviously that requires money to do that. So if you like olive oil, do it, just be very diligent with your, your source. So I've compiled all this information. This is just a brief summary into the book I wrote, Fat for Fuel, which is uh, available pretty much any bookstore online. Uh, a good resource though that you could use is uh, an online nutrient tracker called Chronometer. And it's free, there's no charge for it, and it, and it allow you to carefully uh, enter the foods that you're eating and help you understand if you're within the ratios I just described earlier. Um, the key here though is to need a, a, a kitchen digital scale to measure it. Why chronometer? Because it has literally the most accurate databases. I mean, there are many others out there, but they allow users to enter their own data and then make crowdsource that data to everyone else. And frequently, almost all the time, the data is not correct. So it's got a really elegant, uh, easy to use Windows-based uh, uh, interface. And I really think that if you're serious about implementing this, then this is necessary. Now, if you just want to lose a few pounds, it's not going to be necessary. But if you're treating a serious illness like cancer, or heart disease, or some other life-threatening challenge, then you want to be diligent with this, and it's really vital to use. Uh, we also have a dedicated version of Chronometer that uh, was written specifically for ketogenic, and you just chronometer.com slash Mercola. Now, the other key area that this program is different from paleo is that we do some implement a program called feast famine cycling so you should not be on ketosis continue a lot of people don't understand this and they run into problems because you'll do good for a few weeks and then you'll start to crash 
because your body needs healthy carbohydrates for a wide variety of reasons. It needs to, one of the primary ones is to feed your gut bacteria. And we know that a healthy gut microbiome is, is literally vital for your health. You do this with, so, so how do you implement this? Essentially one or two days a week, ideally the days where you're strength training because when you have more carbs and extra protein, you're gonna stimulate the signal to build muscle tissue and you need muscle tissue. And that's why if you just do continuous ketosis, you'll get really skinny and you'll lose your muscle masses and that's not what you wanna do. So there's another key book here it's called The Plant Paradox. It's written, uh, literally one of the best books written in 2017 for health, uh, written by Dr. Stephen Gundry, who's a real innovator and did a magnificent job of highlighting how eating a plant-based diet can be problematic for many people. And how could that be? Well, he helps us understand that Plants have been here long before we have, and, and a part of their defense strategy to stay alive because they can't walk around and move is they produce these proteins called lectins, L-E-C-T-I-N-S, and these are uh, designed to protect the plants against predators, and they will either annoy them or actually kill them. Now, they don't kill us directly, immediately, initially, but they, they can sabotage our health, and they do to many people. Uh, if you have an autoimmune disease like MS or rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, then you really need to understand the information on the foods that have the lectins and avoid them. So that's a, it's a minor fine tune for the book that I wrote, but it's a really important one. And Dr. Gundry goes into great detail and helps you understand this whole process, why it's important to remove lectins from your diet. And the, it, and it's not that you can't have lectin-based foods, like would, the primary ones would be legumes and, and nightshades like uh, tomatoes and potatoes, but if you cook them in, in like a, a modern day uh, pressure cooker, then you can destroy some of the lectins and they may be edible, but you've got to pay attention to that because it can really be a hidden way to sabotage your health. Another hidden way that can sabotage your health would be excessive iron. Now, if you're a woman who's still menstruating or you're a child, probably not an issue. In fact, you might be iron deficient, relatively common problem in those, those uh, subgroups of people. But if you're a postmenopausal woman, you stopped having your periods for whatever reason, or you're an adult male over the age of 16, then this can become problematic because eventually, we don't have very good ways to eliminate iron. I think from a historical perspective and ancestral perspective, you know, we need, it was beneficial to have excess iron because we had got a really serious blood loss and we didn't have hospitals back thousands of years ago. So, you know, we, you, you could die if you didn't have enough extra iron on board. So, and people didn't live that long. They weren't living beyond 100 years. But when you have excess iron, it creates that, those nasty, pesty, excessive reactive oxygen species I talked about earlier. So, uh, this is just a little pathway that, that illustrates that when you have excess iron within your mitochondria, it combines with the hydrogen peroxide that normally is derived from oxygen and it, and it forms this uh, hydroxyl free radical, which is the most dangerous free radical we know about. And we'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit later. Is, remember, the key is to avoid excessive free radicals, so not by taking antioxidants. So how do you know if you have too much iron? Well, this is a screening test that everyone should have. It's called the serum ferritin. It's available even without a doctor's prescription. It's under $50. Most likely, if you're in the risk factor groups that are risk groups that I mentioned earlier, you're likely going to be well over this level, 40 to 60, uh, probably over 100, maybe even 150, or even higher. The higher it is, the worse it is, the more damage you're having, the more prematurely you're accelerating your, your progress towards death. So get that measured. If it is elevated, then initiate a program of detoxification and therapeutic phlebotomy. The phlebotomy is, uh, could be as simple as donating your blood for the 50% of you who can. Uh, and in fact, this is interesting that there, when we do the epidemiological studies, we find that people who donate their blood two to three times a year, they live a lot longer. They have like half the risk of cancer and heart disease. And this is the reason why is because they're lowering their iron, they're lowering their oxidative stress in their body and the reactive oxygen species. So, this is a picture of me in high school. No, it's not. This is me in actually medical school and 
just reminding me that I uh, made many mistakes when it comes to health and l running long distance was one of them. I don't think you need to do that. I think it's unwise use of time. If you like it and enjoy it, you can, it can be done. But I think there's far better investments of time for your exercise. And one of my favorite is something called the nitric oxide dump. And you can go to Dr. Zach Bush's website and he has something there, but I also, if you type in that term on my website, mercola.com, you'll find a 10 minute video, which I don't have time to do now in an hour's presentation, of me demonstrating this for you. But the reason why you'd want to do it, it's short, it only, only takes about three minutes to do, and it gives you the benefit of going to the gym for about an hour. That won't build strength, but it will build lean muscle mass, but you're not going to get, look like a bodybuilder from doing this. So uh, the, it helps release the nitric oxide that is stored in the blood vessels, lining of your blood vessels. And the, what's the benefit of that? Well, it'll thin your blood. It decreases platelet aggregation. And we know that sticky blood can lead to blood clots, which can cause heart disease, uh, heart attacks, and strokes. So that's a good thing since those are it's a really common, probably the most common cause of death. And it can also radically lower inflammation in your body and we know that inflammation is a core part of why we get sick. So do this two or three times a day and I think you'll find that as an inc it's only going to take less than 10 minutes to do and you'll get the benefits of almost three hours of exercise. So now I want to jump over to something that is not as well known and there's a lot of controversy about this uh, and that is EMF, electromagnetic radiation or frequencies. Part of the reason there's controversy is that there's a uh, significant uh, influences within the industry, the telecommunications industry and, and then even beyond that, that have bought into the idea that microwaves are safe because they only cause thermal damage. And uh, I'll explain what that is in a minute, but I, I want to point your attention to the slide that I have here and, and show you the different types of microwaves. It's not just your microwave oven, but the, interestingly the frequencies that the microwave oven operates is very similar to your cell phones. It's from a few hundred megahertz to a few gigahertz. And it's not only cell phones and microwave ovens, it's your Wi-Fi routers, it's smart meters, smartphones, baby monitors, it's the internet of things. So they, these are, we're constantly being bombarded with this radiation. The radiation is significantly different than ionizing radiation, which is on the right side of the slide. And that's the radiation you get from x-rays or when you fly in a plane, it's gamma rays. And that is, there's a lot more energy in those, that radiation. That's why it's called ionizing because it will ionize biological materials. And it will actually cause single and double stranded breaks in your DNA. Because of that, it can break the covalent bonds. And the, the microwave radiation is much weaker. It does not cause that directly, but it does cause it. I'm going to explain to you why in a moment. So, because it's really interesting and it's, it's fascinating that many of you watching this may be aware that in the, I think of the 40s and 50s, we used to take x-rays of children's feet in the shoe store before they got their shoes to measure their, their, their shoe size, which is crazy. No one does that now because we know it's dangerous. Similarly, I think we're going to come to the same conclusion with the cell phones and, the, and all the other microwave radiation we're being exposed to. So you probably want to know how cell phones cause cancer. Many of you have heard that it can, can, can lead to brain cancer, and we have two United States senators, uh, Ted Kennedy, who died from a, glio, a glioblastoma, and a brain cancer, and now John McCain, who's as we're recording this, just was diagnosed with this this week. So, and this is most likely due to cell, to cell phone use. Uh, there's other variables that contribute, but those are the primary one. But I think that just understanding that is somewhat dangerous because you probably don't know many people personally who come down with brain cancer and they use cell phones all the time. So you kind of dismiss it. Says, this, this is, what type of hogwash is this? But I'm telling you it's true. Now you're going to increase your, dr dramatically increase your risk if you use it and put it next to your head. But you're going to not, that's not the major risk. The major risk is that you're going to die prematurely if you use it. And I'll, I'll tell you why and why it causes cancer. This has only recently been known and probably you've never been exposed to this information before because it was just put together by a uh, professor, Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, and he wrote, wrote a paper in 2013 summarizing research from other investigators who 
actually use calcium channel blockers in in vitro cells assays and in animal studies it showed that when they were on these calcium channel blockers you know drugs that block the effects of calcium channels they didn't have the side effects of EMF exposure that's just extraordinary so how does it work well it all boils down to this voltage gated calcium channel or VGCC as it's called and these calcium channels are embedded within the cell membrane and this is when you understand this you understand why the safety standards which are not based on biology they're just based on theoretical uh, heat thermal uh, calculations is, is absolutely crazy the um, these calcium channels they have uh, they're about seven million times more sensitive to EMF than the charged particles either within or with outside the cell so when you normally expose tissue or biological material to microwaves like in the microwave oven it's going to vibrate real quickly and heat up and it will and these, these same microwaves from your cell phones or Wi-Fi will heat up your tissue too but it doesn't it that's not the way it causes damage so they are correct that there is no thermal damage or relatively minor insignificant damage from cell phones but that's not the biological mechanism. The biological mechanism is related to this voltage-gated calcium channel. And when it's activated, remember, it's 7 million times more sensitive than the, the charged particles which they're measuring, which means the safety standards are up by 7 million. So when the, these microwaves hit these cal voltage-gated calcium channels embedded in your cell membrane, they cause the release of calcium ions to go from the outside of the cell inside the cell. And that causes the cell to make nitric oxide which is normally a good thing and we talked about earlier the nitric oxide dump that you can use but when it occurs in large volumes within the cell it can combine with another free radical called superoxide to form something called perioxynitrate which itself is a reactive nitrogen species and very toxic but it also liberates more hydroxyl free radicals than high iron levels so all this is occurring with inside the cell, not only the cell, but with inside the mitochondria, causing and this, this enormous oxidative stress, which, which again damages your cell membranes, cell proteins, and DNA. And these re oxidative stress is actually what causes the DNA to break in single and double stranded brands, uh, uh, strands even more so than when you expose your body to ionizing radiation from gamma rays or x-rays that we're normally exposed to. I'm not talking about going to Fukushima and exposing yourself to a lethal dose, but I'm talking the typical, the biologically considered normal. So you'll get more uh, genetic DNA damage from exposure to the microwaves than you will from the ionizing radiation. And this has been well proven in a number of studies and it's virtually unknown by anyone. So that it's all due to this biologically destructive free radical, hydroxyl free radical. So how can you prevent this? Uh, or no, what are the conditions that are associated with this before we go into how to prevent it? Uh, a lot of them begin with A. We have an epidemic of Alzheimer's. And it's important to understand that these voltage gated calcium channels the highest density in your body is in your nervous tissue, in your brain, and in the pacemaker of your heart. So uh, that's why conditions like Alzheimer's or cardiac arrhythmias, if you know anyone who's atrial fib, atrial flutter, then this is really important information to, for them because they're usually put on toxic medications to control this, or sometimes they're even used uh, ablative uh, surgery to destroy the nerve tissue and all they have to do is reduce the exposure to the EMFs. Autism, it's definitely a big factor for autism. Anxiety and depression because these voltage-gated calcium channels are also responsible for releasing neurotransmitters in neuroendocrine hormones. So when you disrupt those by exposing your body to EMF you're going to cause these types of complications. Interestingly, another tissue that's associated with it is the testes in the male, so it's been clearly associated with infertility. Uh, and it could also exacerbate your body's ability to eliminate parasites and heavy metals because when you are exposed to this, it's very difficult to detoxify or uh, have your immune responsibly and appropriately 
uh, address the parasite infections. And parasites are a big issue for many of us. So how can you mitigate this damage? One of the ways is that you can use magnesium. Uh, this is not proven yet, it's just theoretical because magnesium uh, can, uh, has been shown to serve very similarly as a, many of these calcium channel blockers and lower your blood pressure. Uh, and the, the, it's believed to do it for this mechanism. So uh, we're actually in the process of, of uh, doing some studies now to understand this more carefully exactly what the responses are. Um, uh, you could also do something like SOD or superoxide dismutase, which, which would lower the superoxide within the cell, potentially even calcium channel blockers. And I'm not a big fan of using drugs, but if you were, this may be an appropriate use for them if you're in a situation where you just had uh, a, a, lo a, ma a massive exposure to EMF that you couldn't mitigate in any way, because that's the first, is to lower your exposure to the EMF, and I'll tell you how to do that in a moment. You want to measure it. So the way that you measure it, there's a number of meters on the market. This one is called the TES-593. Uh, it's available for about $350, so normally it retails for $500, but if you look it up on Google Shopping, you'll find somewhere to get it. And uh, it's pretty good. Uh, I've used it, and, and I have two physicians who are friends who have purchased it and used it, and every one of us, all three of us, have found, and we're all pretty literate when it comes to this issue. We all know the dangers of EMF. But we were exposed unknowingly to these sources all around our house. We had no idea that we're even there because they may have been put there many years ago. We forgot about them, and, uh, or our wireless mouse. You know, it clearly will show and identify the sources. And it will help motivate you to take one of the most important actions you can, which is to turn off your Wi-Fi. I know it's challenging to do, but you've got to turn it off at night. You're not using it anyway. But to, to actually take the next step and turn it off in the daytime too, doesn't mean that you don't access the internet. It means you, use it, you do it through a wire. And even if your computer is a notebook and it doesn't have an ethernet, Port, they make adapters that you can plug in an Ethernet cable and you know from your modem into your uh, computer and then you can get the internet signal that way. This way you're not exposed to high EMFs all day long. Um, really important strategy. And that's because you these other suggestions I said are ways that you can help mitigate against it in scenarios or situations where you have no control, like when you're traveling or at work. But when you're at home, you've got to have the highest quality possible if you want to uh, hope to optimize your health. Now, another strategy, and many of you have heard of this before, I actually pioneered this nearly 20 years ago now, uh, is educate people about the importance of vitamin D. But here's some key points here. The best way to get it, the absolute best way is to get it from sunshine. I know that's not possible for many of you, but it doesn't dispute the fact that that is the way we were designed to get vitamin D, not to swallow it from a pill, but to get it from the sun. Because when you get it from the sun, you're getting a lot of other therapeutic benefits. You're not only getting the ultraviolet B radiation, ultraviolet A, but you're also getting the infrared and the red and the near infrared and the mid and the far. So th these wavelengths are beneficial to your health. So the vitamin D is extraordinarily useful, but you are sabotaging your health and you're only getting it by swallowing a pill. You need to get it from the sun. And, and your ideal dose is 40 to 60 nanograms. One of the things that the infrared radiation and the ultraviolet will do also is it structures your water. And I'm sure many of you have heard of structured water. Dr. Pollock, a biophysicist at the University of Washington, has talked about this. He calls it easy water, easy water. But uh, the best water, the structured water that you can possibly do is not to drink it, but to create it within your cells. And the way that you do that is to, it doesn't cost anything. You just go outside, expose a lot of your skin to the sun when it's out, and you will structure your water. That's what, it, that's what the energy does. And it also helps facilitate some of these proteins in the electron transport chain within the mitochondria, and it makes them more efficient, and they ultimately make ATP more, more efficiently. Now, another form of EMF radiation that most of us are exposed to is uh, artificial lighting. There's not necessarily intrinsically wrong with it, especially prior to 1970 when we had incandescent lights. You see, for, since humans have been around on this planet, however long you believe that is, the, up until uh, 150 years or so ago, the only light 
that we had at night, aside from the stars and the moon, was a thermal light or a fire, a candle. That was the only light we had. So that was what your biology, your friends, your family's biology is adapted to. And when you expose your body to artificial light at night that's far removed from this, you're going to cause damage. Obviously we know about the bl blocking blue light before you go to bed to s not suppress the production of melatonin, but it's more important, it's, there's, it's far more comprehensive than that. Now, the safest light to use in your home at night would be a candle of the thermal source, the heat source. Uh, but the next one would be an incandescent bulb, and the sad reality is, of course, is that most governments have banned these, these bulbs, so it's, they're far more expensive and less convenient to get now. But this, these were the primarily the only bulbs we had. Now, the reason they were banned was for a good reason, because they're energy hogs. They consume up to 20 times more energy than an LED bulb would. So do they save energy? Do they cut your electrical cost down? Absolutely. But they do it at a cost, and it cost is to your biology. And the reason they do that is because most of the wasted energy uh, in an incandescent bulb is emitted as infrared radiation. What does that do? That helps your biology. Remember, I told you, it structures your, bio, your water and it, and it nourishes your mitochondria. So now, obviously it's not gonna do that really well if you're far away from the light source, but there is a benefit for that. LED has no infrared. I mean, they do have infrared LEDs, but in a conventional commercial LED light for, for used to light your house, it's not gonna have any infrared in it. It's not gonna have any red. It's just primarily blue and yellow and green. That's it. And, these, and it comes in spikes, it's digital, and it pulses, and it's just, it, it destroys cellular health. Now, they're not as dangerous as if you're in a room in the daytime and you have access to sunlight coming through the window because that will balance it out and it'll, it'll mitigate the effects. But if you're in a room where that's the only light source and it's the middle of the day, and that's, you know, if you turn off those lights, it would be black, then you've got to mitigate against that too because it's going to be unbalanced. That's definitely going to cause biological problems. And on this graph, you can see the spectrums of daylight, which you see has quite a lot of blue. So we need, blue light is healthy. It's just the amount that you get and when you get it. So an incandescent bulb, you see, has very low amount of blue, some, but very low. And, it's, and that's why it's safer to use that at night. You can see the uh, fluorescence and then the, the, uh, the cool white LEDs, which are the worst. They have this huge blue, spe blue peak and virtually no red or near infrared. Uh, so that's why you want to use a uh, incandescent bulb or candle would be ideal. And this is just another graph showing a little more clearly some of the frequencies that are in the different light sources so that you can see, you know, you want that incandescent is the healthiest one for night. So the incandescent bulb, and ideally you'd want to get the clear ones. So you don't have to switch your entire house over to them at all. Just the bulbs that you'd normally turn on at night so that would be your kitchen or your bathroom or your bedroom. But you know, if you've got a large house, you may only need to have a t ten, a six or ten bulbs to use at all. So it doesn't become as costly as it may sound. Now, if you're in that room, as I mentioned earlier, with this artificial light, uh, then you're going to want to get some type of protection for your retina. And it doesn't have to be expensive. You can get these glasses on Amazon. There are blue blocking glasses, and you could you certainly get more stylish ones, but these are under $10. So there's kind of like no financial or economic excuse not to use them. It might be a cosmetic one, but you can spend more and get more elegant looking glasses. And I actually like the red glasses when the sun goes down at night uh, because they block not only the blue, but the green and the yellow, and it's a little better for you. So I actually have both pairs of these and depending on the time of the day is when I would use them. But if it was in the daytime and I was in a uh, lecturing in a, in a hall with artificial lights, I would not wear the red. It would be very difficult to see, but I would wear the blue blockers and that would be more than sufficient. Now you're also going to want to be careful of the screens that you're using because they they are, your computer screens have, emit our other LEDs and they emit this blue light. So there's a Fortunately, on our phones, we have Android has a blue light filter, and so does uh, iOS. Um, but you, but the best one, if or your computer, is something called Iris uh, 
uh, there's a mini version and the full iris version is, uh, gives you the most control and will give you the most elegant way to reduce your blue light and not damage your retina. So another way that we can damage mitochondria is by drinking tap water that's loaded with fluoride. And fluoride is a poison. Uh, and like many people are misled to believe that it's actually preventing tooth decay. Uh, it may do that, but uh, only when applied topically, not when swallowed. So very little, if no evidence to support the use of oral fluoride as is being used. So take fluoride out of your water supply. Now there are certain minerals you can use to improve your health. Uh, these are the, like the essential minerals that I think most every one of us needs. Magnesium, as I mentioned earlier, is also potentially useful for blocking the, the side effects of EMF. Selenium, useful for thyroid health, but also to help us make more glutathione. Uh, zinc is re really useful in detoxification, and most of us are low in zinc. And iodine, again, for thyroid, but uh, it's something almost everyone is uh, deficient in. So another way that you can stay healthy and help stop damaging your mitochondria is to remove toxic exposures. And one of the ways you can do this is a far infrared sauna. Just want to be, be careful and use, make sure that it's low EMF because many of the far infrared saunas uh, did not pay attention to that. And you can actually measure, measure this with a, a Gauss meter, a tri-field meter. Um, make sure it's made of natural materials so it's not outgassing and causing you know, the release of toxins into your system. And you, I would supplement it with a near infrared uh, exposure, and there's a number of different devices on the market that would do this, but uh, they're not integrated into the same, same one. They're usually separate standalone units so that you could do them either before or after you're going into the sauna. And then uh, consider using ozone too within the sauna, but you've got to uh, be careful that because you don't want to breathe ozone, you just want to, so you don't, wouldn't put it, it would, you'd have to use something like a tent sauna so that your head wasn't exposed to the sauna. Uh, but this is a good strategy to use. So when you integrate all these strategies together, when you're paying attention to the food you're eating, the photobiology, and the, the pernicious toxic exposures like EMF, and uh, then you're going to improve the health of your mitochondria, which will, when they're healthy, when you're, they're not damaged, you're essentially going to help your body take control over your health and uh, essentially address the fundamental core why we tend to get sick and age prematurely is by uh, all related to the function health of our mitochondria and the, uh, and the neglected dimension of the exercise we've talked about the nitric oxide dump that's another important strategy because when you do exercise you're going to increase uh, BDNF which is brain derived neurotropic factor which is a fertilizer fuel for your brain but it also improves your mitochondria it increases something called mitochondrial biogenesis through it causes your new mitochondria to grow. Uh, so it's all about keeping those mitochondria healthy. So there's a lot more details on this. This is just a brief overview, but the best I can do in an hour, and hopefully you've captured some good information. But if, if you still need more details, look at some of the books I mentioned, go to our site, mercola.com. We, we expand on this on a regular basis and to give you the information you need so that you can finally and fully capture your health and take control of it. Are you ready to take your health and wellness career to the next level? Have you always dreamed of having a career in natural medicine? Do you need to expand and protect your professional health practice with proper credentials? Then take the next step and start an exciting, successful and meaningful career by enrolling in an online degree program in natural and integrative medicine at Quantum University.